Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of my dream team at the Exco and my team of awesome esteemed speakers, I bid you a very warm welcome to our RGS Alumni Financial Empowerment Webinar entitled Reflection Startup Trailblazers. Startup entrepreneurs are the new heroes and icons of the business world. Today, we have on our panel five Reflection Startup Trailblazers whose focus is on creating impactful benefits for society, guided by values of doing good through their startups, accelerators, and their endeavors. The purpose of this webinar is for us to expand our vista of the startup space through the lens and journeys of these startups. Their entrepreneurs, these startup entrepreneurs, as we leverage on their experience and expertise. They will share on their individual pet topics. And after all, they have, after all of them have spoken, we will open the floor for Q&A. Please send in your answer, questions. We would love to hear from you. Um, just for the record, this webinar is recorded and all of today's um, going-ons will be uploaded to our RGS YouTube and social media. Without further ado, I would like to invite our first trailblazer, Ms. Chong Chek-Ping. Ms. Chong is a director and managing partner of Green Meadows Accelerator and Small World Accelerator Private Limited. She is from the class of 1969, full of experience, and she's from the Richardson House. She will share on the perspective and learning journey of an angel investor. Over to you, Chet. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we were early on talking about the fact that it's such a great thing to have technology to be able to host 330 people. Is that why it is, job? Yes, it is. Yeah, and uh, you know, I was just thinking how much space we would have needed if it was going to be physical meeting. Okay. Anyway, I am uh, what I would call myself an accidental angel investor. I uh, actually had spent 33 years with Hewlett Packard. I really enjoyed every bit of it. I feel very blessed to have worked in Hewlett Packard. And my life has been like zipping in and out of airports, in and out of meetings, and uh, you know, going to various parts of the world to kind of meet up with people. So when I left HP, I had two years as a consultant. I never liked it. It was very good money, by the way but I never liked it because I couldn't influence what was going on. And I was just doing everything that the client want me to say and want me to do, and that's not me, okay? So I did two years of nothing. And initially it was very fun, drink coffee and have friends and all that. But after a while I sat there and said, okay, what did I do today? What was my accomplishment for today? And I've come to realize that, hey, actually there's really nothing I have done for the day. Sorry, I'm very driven, right? I've been trained in HP, bottom line, end results and all that. So then I, uh, you know, was blessed or is blessed to meet an American. And this American had been a, a founder of a company that was listed in NASDAQ. And he wanted to do some startups in Singapore, okay? And he spoke with me and I was linked through some friends and all that. And then I sat there and I said, this is it. This is where I want to go, okay? The reason why I tell myself this is why I want to go is because when I was working in HP, all our lives, we do nothing but worry about how to keep jobs in Singapore. Uh, we have closed off meetings with EDB because jobs were leaking out, going to China and every part of it. By the way, my background is mostly manufacturing. Okay, so, you know, factories leaked out of Singapore throughout the last uh, 10, 15, 20 years. So, and I felt this is it because of the fact that, you know, um, when you look at America, right, every downturn in America, they will have an Uber, they will have a Facebook that bring them back up again. And then if you look at us, right, we, we I don't think, we will be able to have an Uber or Alibaba because of the fact that we are a very small country, our market is small, so it's very hard to hit the size that they have hit. But the, the reality is that if we can create our own, okay, at the site, create small companies and create a, 
a niche kind of uh, industry for ourselves, we will be good. Okay, so therefore in 2010, I decided I want to be in the startup world. I want to learn from my partner who is in the US but a PR of Singapore on how to do startups. And that's the beginning of my journey. And I really enjoy every bit of it. The second reason why I want to be in the startup world is I feel a lot for the people I work for in HP. With HP moving out activities, a lot of them are what you call the PMET, right? And they don't have a job. And a lot of them don't really need the money because they've earned it throughout the years, but they need something to keep this going, just like the journey I went through. And I'm very glad that in the years, you know, I'm able to bring some of these people to the startups, useful for them and useful for the startups. So that's why I, I so believe in this whole startup journey. And I really believe that Singapore needs startup as another pillar of uh, growth for the economy. I'm very, I, I feel a very, a very strong conviction about this. Okay, so that's, that's how I got into this startup world. Initially, I did not put money, by the way. My partner put in, my American partner put in all the money. But I also have come to realize that, you know, you have to put money where your mouth is, right? So I then gone, go into putting my own money, investment and all that, and started, you know, investing in companies. So that's my journey, right? So throughout the last 11 years now, um, I have been investing in companies, various companies, some successful, uh, I would say successful, but some on the path to success. And some are like, some have died, many have died actually. And, uh, but, but, but it had been a very, very fulfilling learning journey for me. And the things that I look for in a startup before I invest, right? What do I look for? Okay, essentially because of the fact that I invest in very, very early stage what we call seed and pre-seed, um, all the financials, numbers, IRR and all that don't matter because there's no I nothing to measure, right? Because when you start a company, there's really nothing to measure. But from a financial perspective, we actually measure what we call a runway. That means if we put X dollars into the company, we want to know the span and to know how long the company will survive. And typically we do not invest in any company that do not have enough. If let's say we put in say 500,000 in a company, if they don't last beyond 12 to 18 months, we don't put that money in. That means, you know, they don't have enough runway to, to take care of their, their you know, long-term goal of achieving the product uh, uh, development and things like that. So that's, that's the financial part of it. But the second, Part of it, which is more important in my view, is the technology, okay? Uh, because of the fact that this is a startup, if it's a me too thing, we do not invest. We only invest in companies that's got IP that can differentiate, okay? And, and that, that the market that they're addressing, they're able to scale that market. So, so we pay a lot of attention to that and verification to make sure that indeed the company can achieve that, okay? And, and, and the other part is because of the fact that we actually invest in companies, more, part of why I'm in this startup is because I feel like I can make a difference and add value to the whole startup uh, uh, ecosystem because of my past experience in HP. Uh, I, we do, we, when I say we, me and my partners, we do look at whether we add value to the company. In part is to help the company, but the other part is really, you know, uh, if we can add value to the company, the company will be successful and the money we put in would have become good, right? So that's, that's that part of it. And um, the last, and I would say the last, but the most important one to us is actually the founding team. Every single failure, I've done the peel the onion on every single failure and every, uh, every single failure that we have, every single so-called more successful company that we have, when you peel the onion on it, in the end, it is the founders. The founders are the most important and the founding team. And, and I'll elaborate a, a bit on this, sharing with you the experiences we have 
with some of the founders uh, when we work with them. So I'll go to the better ones first, okay? Uh, uh, typically, when we find that the uh, companies that are successful, the founders are usually very resilient, lots of tenacity, and willing to come down to the ground and, and understand their problem at the root of things and to move from there when, when problem hits them, okay? And one example I have is a company that makes a golf simulation device, okay? Way back in 2012, this company was uh, down to $30,000, third engineering revision, no customer in sight, okay? And of course, I walked up to this, uh, this founder and, I, and he, by the way, so he's a Turkish, but it's a PR of Singapore and he's lived in Singapore for a long time. And uh, I said, what do you need? Of course, it's money, right? So um, we managed to get some friends, family and friends together and put 270,000 on him. And then we called up, uh, uh, those days was called Sing Spring Singapore, now it's called Enterprise Singapore. Uh, and, and this enterprise Singapore friend of mine came and took a look and said, yeah, this is great technology. So they gave him a proof of concept, a money of 250,000. So the total is 520,000, right? That's 2012, okay? We also got a XHP person, okay? A PR, a, a, a Swiss, German Swiss, and he helped him with sales and marketing. He's a very powerful guy, okay, this, this Swiss German guy. And from that day on, today we we'll look at that, the rest is history for him. Today, he's a double digit growth, double digit revenue, double digit cash, and double digit profit company. And, uh, and every day, every time when I see him, he say, I'm gonna to work towards being a unicorn. And he does golf simulators. And besides golf, now he's into baseball simulation. He's into, he's looking at other games too. And it's full of IP because it's all around AI, machine learning and stuff like that combined with the hardware that he has. So, so this is a real success story for us, okay? And picking my fingers crossed when he keeps telling me he's gonna be a unicorn. Um, the other company that we, uh, that we work with is uh, actually an XHP friend of mine, okay? And they make solar, portable solar products. And he keep going on it, he keep going on it. And he's very close to the, he was very close to the cliff, okay? The edge of the cliff. And uh, I had to back him to close the company because I felt that it's not fair to him and he wasn't taking salary. I have to back him to take salary. And, but it's a good thing that he had money to, to see his family through. And he felt very strongly about the, the, the product itself. He feels that he could crack the market. And then in 2017, 18, he really cracked the market. He's now selling very well through the um, MFIs, uh, you know, financial institutions, okay? Into the third world, into rural India. For, for solar, portable so, solar products, and it's going into Africa, Philippines, and things like that. Uh, I mean, company, uh, countries like that. So again, you know, it is his resilience, it's his tenacity, is amazing, right? And he's now talking about growing, going somewhere, and moving things. So that's, that's another story and another display of tenacity and, and resilience, okay? But we also have bad stories. I have bad stories to tell you, okay? Uh, we have like a startup where uh, they did not declare, but actually they uh, had companies in Malaysia that is owned by the wife and, uh, and actually they transact within themselves, okay? And when we found out, well, I actually claw back the money. I actually got a lawyer to make sure we claw back the money because, you know, to me, it's one thing to be, to be, you know, to fail because, you know, things don't work out and try very hard, you fail, but to be dishonest is very, is, is terrible for me. And there's another company where it fail uh, or is failing. Uh, again, you know, the, the people were making use of all the grants from the government and, you know, kind of playing around things and all that. So uh, as we speak now, I'm still forcing them to uh, close. 
So they are good story, bad story, and I'm sure you know you you get the drift from where what I'm saying here. Um, so that's so much for the type of people that we look for. And of course, you know, sometimes we judge wrongly. I mean, as an investor, you, on the surface of things, it looks good, but sometimes we make mistakes. Or maybe a lot of times we make mistakes. That's a better way to put it. So that's what we look for. And the kind of support that we provide to the uh, 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 investors, we, we do all kinds of support uh, because me and my partners, uh, some of us are into technology, some of us understand marketing, some of us understand operations. We do link them with suppliers overseas because we've worked with all these suppliers in the past because they make hardware products. Uh, we also do um, link them with uh, uh, um, uh, investors if they need it. And we also help them to, uh, to uh, make sure that they get the right set of uh, financials in place. And if they need, need legal help, legal documents is always a big deal in, in, the, in the investment world. And we help them with that. Uh, so, so we do that. But in all the years that I have worked with them, there's one thing I find that is of most use to each and every one of these investees if they like to talk to you because not all your investees would want, all, not all my investees want to talk to me, is that uh, they actually look a lot to us for advice on how to deal with team dynamics, how to work through the people. There will always be people issues. There will always be uh, differences in expectation. And I have found that, uh, you know, most of them, they find most useful talking to us, maybe because we have years of experience working with people through uh, in, in this whole thing. So, so that's, that's my finding in, in terms of giving support to them, okay? So, so, so much for that and um, for how we look at things, how we work with investees and all that. So in the interest of time, I kind of just want to kind of close and round up a bit is that I, I do want for those of you who are interested to become uh, startup founders or those of you who are already in startup, this is some of the things I see and my, my, my little input for you. And I don't claim to be right in everything, but that's kind of my own view of things. Um, I think there will always be peaks and valleys in whatever you do. And, um, and I think, you know, the most important thing is to sometimes take a breather, sometimes uh, celebrate little successes and recognize that the journey is going to be very, very long. Okay. And take pride in whatever you do and, and, uh, and, and, and have that mindset that it could have been worse. By the way, this mindset of it could have been worse was taught to me by my American friends. Okay. And so, so take that mindset, just keep going. Um, you should stay focused on what you're trying to do. But at the same time, I also feel that uh, we, you also need to know when to quit because sometimes the journey you walk may be coming to a dead end. So it takes judgment to do that. Um, early on, I gave the example of this, uh, this founder who is close to the edge of the cliff. He didn't give up, even though I told him to give up. And so, so, so it's a judgment call, right? So you need, to dis you need to know for yourself, which is the best, okay? I think you should take as much advice as you can from other people, but at the end of the day, remember you are in charge. You are answerable to whatever the outcome might be. And so you have to take charge of the outcome and you have to take charge of your own path. Okay, and always always pay attention to governance issue. Um, I, I actually sat on the board of Razor in its early days, and you all know that Ming Liang is a lawyer, and I never understood why he need another lawyer working for him as a cop sec, his internal cop, corporate secretary. And so when they had the first Series A investor, uh, the first statement that came from the board representation from that investor was, we have checked their books and it's very clean. Then I understood. 
understood what he was trying to do. So, so you know, paperwork is always a painful thing to do, but keep it as clean as possible. I'm not suggesting that you should spend your whole life worrying about paperwork, but just make sure and keep it in order as much as you can because you need it as more investors come into play. And last but not least, I think it's okay to fail. Just as long as you learn from it, it is really okay to fail. In fact, in the US, I think Natalie is in the US, uh, it is a fact that if you are a failed founder, you are more valuable than a brand new founder. Okay, so yeah, it is okay to fail. So that's kind of my food for thoughts for the invest, uh, for, for founders. And for myself, every day I give myself a reminder to be very patient with the companies that I invest in. Be very patient with the founders because you know it's not an easy, a easy journey. It's very arduous for any founder. Okay, be very very patient. What I want don't want to see my money go down the drain. I keep telling myself it is patient money. Just be patient. Okay, that's all I have. Back to you, Job. Thank you so much, Chet, uh, for the sagacious words that you're sharing with everyone on who, what, why, and how of angel investing. Everyone, as you can see, uh, Chet has got vast experience in, um, in, in angel investing and having spent um, over a decade in uh, angel investing. She has also spent 30, after 33 years in HP with her last posting as a senior vice president of uh, Asia Pacific operations. Uh, she's an amazing woman, uh, always uh, willing to share her experiences with everyone and i'm really glad to have you um take on questions after this uh, yeah so uh, maybe i should add here um you know you all have my contact anytime just drop drop me a note i'm on linkedin too so you know if you need anything i'm happy to help at my age it doesn't matter sharing is the most important absolutely and if you have an idea that needs funding you know where to get the seed funding from oh that part <laughs> Okay. You know, I'm so delighted to welcome everyone again as the room is expanding. Um, I'd like to welcome guests from US, from UK, from Mauritius, from Italy, and of course, everyone in Singapore enjoying this time together and learning on this beautiful afternoon. Um, um, we also have a special guest, our minister, Senior Minister of State, uh, Siman, and, and I welcome you too and thank you for um, making time and, you know, to be with us and to support this endeavor. The next person I'd like to call on to speak is uh, Dr. Grace Su. This pretty lady here, Dr. Grace Su. All the RGS girls are really good lookers. So that's what someone told me when I sent him, by the way, he's from RI, um, our EDM. And he said, oh, all the speakers are so good looking. I said, yeah. And I thank him for being here today. And you know who you are. Dr. Grace Su is the co-founder and COO of Zoomvet. She's from the class of 2005 and Richardson House. Grace is the co-founder of COO of ZoomVet. She's passionate about animal welfare and is a cat mom to two adopted local cats, women after my heart. Her medical background has provided her with keen insight on the perspective of healthcare providers, and she's on a mission to raise the standards of veterinary care. Dr. Su worked at both government and private healthcare institutions before consulting on Dr. Anywhere. Her experience in human telemedicine inspired the use of technology to solve issues of access to healthcare for pets. Grace holds a Bachelor of Medicine, Bachelor of Surgery degree from the National University of Singapore. Over to you, Grace. Hi, thanks so much for the introduction. So um, I'm Grace, uh, the co-founder of ZoomVet, a pet telehealth platform. So um, a lot of times, one of the questions I get is whether or not I'm a vet. I'm a vet. So no, I'm not a vet. Uh, I'm a human doctor by training. Um, admittedly, uh, if someone had asked if I could imagine myself being in the position that I am in today, I would have said no. Um, I'm a human doctor. And that was also how I first met my co-founder, Athena, when she recruited me to work for her company, um, which was a human tele uh, telehealth platform. And uh, we subsequently bonded over the fact that we had both recently adopted cats, uh, were first time cat owners and did not really know what to do with them. So we both worked full time jobs, um, lived on our own 
and were basically the sole caregivers of our fur babies. Um, we've experienced firsthand the struggle of juggling work commitments while trying to be the model pet parent. Uh, we also had like a multitude of seemingly silly questions, such as, is my cat peeing all over because she's really angry at me? Or is there actually something else that I'm missing? And unfortunately, telling your boss that you'd like to take childcare leave um, to bring your pet to the vet doesn't usually fly. Uh, and more often than not, we find that pet owners will take a wait and see approach. Sometimes this works out and resolves will resolve on their own. Um, and sometimes this would mean that smaller issues are left to fester until they build and eventually result in hefty medical bills. So being unable to conveniently access professional veterinary advice was an issue that we saw telemedicine as a solution for. And we also realized that we were unlikely to be the only ones facing this problem. So going back to human healthcare, one of the biggest issues we talk about is access to healthcare, whether it is being able to physically get to a clinic or a hospital, or financial access in terms of being able to reasonably afford healthcare or insurance, or even educational access where one would need to know when they might need to seek medical care. We decided to then bring our human telehealth business lessons into how we structured the vet. Our workflows and escalation measures are based on human telehealth guidelines, and we keep this standard even though pet telemedicine is actually not regulated in Singapore. Um, the pet owner, our customers, um, are at the heart of every one of our product decisions, and by incorporating a digital element to their pet's health, we want to build an online to offline ecosystem that addresses the pet's healthcare needs. So when I compare human and veterinary healthcare, um, I've noticed that veterinary medicine tends to follow the trends in human medicine, a bit like with several years delay. So globally, veterinary medicine actually lacks a lot of the data infra infrastructures that exists in human healthcare. Uh, and we've identified this lack of data as the main hurdle to understanding pet healthcare and have decided to build a system to capture pertinent data points in the pet care journey. So ZoomVet was our pandemic baby. Uh, it was unplanned. Uh, the timing was unplanned, um, but it, it did work to our advantage. So we launched um, in Singapore at the end of 2019 and saw an organic increase in the demand for our services as pet owners were forced to seek alternatives to clinic consultations. So growing a company during such unusual times uh, was both terrifying, but also very, very exciting. We had to ramp up our medical operations to meet the growing demand while ensuring that we still delivered the same quality of care while still also having to manage a growing company amidst a global pandemic. We had a, a small team of four uh, and ensuring that we could still inspire, manage the team remotely was a situation that I never dealt with. So I think sort of um, linking back to what she had said, I think people management is definitely something that um, a lot of startups grapple with. Um, and trying to understand what drove motivation, you know, how in employees are incentivized in what seemed like a really fragmented um, work environment was an interesting but frustratingly unstraightforward issue to try and navigate. So as a startup, uh, we were definitely bootstrapping, uh, which meant that we had to do more with what little we had. Each Zoom vet team member had to wear many hats. Um, all of us had to be creative in our resource management and everyone needed to proactively step up to fill in whenever, wherever there were gaps that were present. This also meant that we did not have the luxury to keep people who weren't effective. We definitely had to have the right people with the right mindset who also bought into the vision and possessed a drive to want to make this become a reality. So in my journey as a startup founder, I have learned somewhat painfully and uncomfortably how it feels to hire and fire people uh, and have also learned how to hire the net better the next time around. Um, we've also learned to value and listen to what our team members as individuals want and how this would feed into eventually building the dream team. So, I mean, one example of a hiring conundrum that we faced um, would be the question of whether we should be hiring expectant or to be expectant females. Um, asking about family planning can be such a taboo thing to do in an interview. Um, 
I think because more often than not, it's assumed that this information will overshadow you know, any merits that a great candidate may possess. Um, and navigating this was very tricky because as a startup, um, we were faced with resource constraints. Um, and for us, you know, a four month maternity leave would basically mean investing time to have to look for replacements during our staff's maternity leave, as well as needing to you know, invest additional finances um, in supporting this particular staff who was on maternity leave. Um, unfortunately, as a startup, we also don't have the real luxury of additional manpower to help cover for someone else because in a lean team, extra cover doesn't really exist. Um, but we've also realized that we wanted to build a progressive company where we didn't necessarily measure an employee's effectiveness through man hours, but through actual output and productivity, where clocking hours in the office weren't as important if remote working really suited an employee better. We wanted employees who were able to work smart and not just hard. Um, we wanted to build an intelligent company where protocols and standards weren't simply upheld because tradition and, and you know, it's what has always been done and it just sort of seemed right. I've also realized through our many rounds of hiring and firing um, how important the right person is and that our maternity leave conundrum really all just sort of boiled down to trust. Um, we had to trust our employee to be accountable and plan for our absence. Um, and it's really not easy to find good people. We were better off investing in an asset who wanted to be in ZoomVet and contribute, even if this meant planning for maternity leave, than you know, choosing someone else who was of a poor fit, but you know, would always be around. So learning from this, um, and also to reflect this ethos of mutual trust and accountability, we've also gone on to implement policies such as unlimited leave to allow our staff um, the freedom to take as much leave that, as they like, but in the benefit or in the interest of ZoomVet. So I'm, I'm quite proud to be in a company that sort of balances idealism with effectiveness um, and isn't afraid to do things in a slightly different way. So fundraising uh, during the pandemic uh, was also a very interesting period. Um, I think what usually is a very face-to-face, in-person type of um, communication um, now had to be taken um, to an online situation. And it was definitely a little bit more difficult to develop rapport. This was also layered with the fact uh, that at ZoomVet, uh, we were two female founders which um, I personally feel can be a double-edged sword. So, I mean, as much as I'd like to think that we were strong, independent women um, living in a modernized, forward-thinking society, I'd still wonder if our gender was a disadvantage to how seriously an investor would took us, uh, take us. And if this particular label of a female founder would allow investors to see, you know, founders as uh, founders who are women uh, in a separate class from, say, the rest of the founders. And I would worry um, that this would allow investors to write women founders smaller checks. Um, so much so that sometimes we joke about hiring a male model uh, just to talk to our investors. But really, I mean, jokes aside, um, regardless of gender, uh, fundraising is never easy. I don't think it's meant to be an easy journey. Um, and we really pulled through based on pure grit having a really, really thick skin, um, as well as a willingness to continuously improve our pitch based on um, any feedback that investor gave us. Um, I'm now very, very grateful that we found a dedicated group of investors who didn't buy into the idea of ZoomVet simply because we were their you know, token female founders, but because they really believed in the company's vision, uh, as well as our capability to execute and deliver. So fast forward to this year, um, we sort of braved through our initial growing pains and are now able to focus on the more fun stuff. So from the start, um, ZoomVet has always taken a very data-driven approach to trying to understand pet healthcare. And after a year of collecting this data, we now have a clearer picture as well as better insights into the pet healthcare journey. We can understand you know, when pet owners seek help, what types of pet owners seek help, what problems are the most prevalent at various age ranges, as well as what you know, treatment costs look like, as well as where these costs could possibly be lowered, 
and you know, eventual medical outcome. It's exciting because this data opens up opportunities to help shelters um, improve you know, pet adoption rates through providing better support for new pet parents. Um, it also provides novel ways of using technology and remote care to lower the cost of chronic care in pets, or even you know, chances of um, a way of changing the payment model for pet health care through structuring more meaningful insurance plans for pet owners. We also saw that this um, particular issue of inaccessibility to healthcare was one that was not unique to Singapore and that there are huge opportunities to grow in the region. So we have um, since closed our seed round uh, and now have the daunting task of taking Zoom back to new markets. And I guess along with this new mandate, um, a host of new problems and hurdles to overcome. Um, but I'm very, very excited about what is to come. Um, because we've managed to build a passionate team at ZoomVet with diverse skills, but a unified focus. And I think this, this poises us to weather bigger storms um, better. Um, so far, it's been a really fulfilling journey. Uh, I enjoy being challenged, and I feel that I have grown as an individual through this experience. Um, I think I am happier, even though my friends will say that I've fallen off the face of the earth and now work longer, crazier hours. Um, but it really feels amazing to be able to shape my work environment um, and build a company culture that resonates with my personal values. Um, I really love that ZoomVet is a mission-driven team at heart and that what ties us together is a desire to contribute back to the pet community and the vision of making pet care affordable and accessible to all pet owners. Um, so yeah, I hope that that was an interesting insight into my journey, co-founding my early stage startup, ZoomVet. Um, and yeah, if you're curious about what we do, do check out our website or follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Thank you so much, Grace, uh, for the really fun, uh, fun sharing, uh, perfect sharing um, on uh, positive uh, positive positivity on your pet, on your Zoom pet. And congratulations on your seven figure seed round fundraising. Um, next speaker we have is uh, Juna Zhu, a very beautiful young lady with a heart uh, for Silvers. Juna is the co-founder of Strong Silvers. She's from class of 2004. So you can work out how young she is. And she's from Tablet House. She's an alumni of course of RGS and is currently running her each tech business. So interesting, strong service. After spending a decade in venture capital investing in technology businesses in US and South Asia, Junas is passionate about exploring what it means to age well and is also an Alice Lim Memorial Fund gerontology scholar under the SUSS SR Nagan School of Human Development. She was also in the Handbell Choir in RGS with Ming Xuan, who is coming on as a speaker, and currently continues to pursue the arts through competitive dance sports. We will get her on the RGS Dance Sports Initiative coming up soon. But over to you now, Junis. Thank you, George. Can everyone hear me? Perfect. Okay, so I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking, not, not just about um, what Strong Service is about, but just moving backward, getting a bigger perspective, I want to talk about building businesses as a platform for change. So knowing that we are not just building scalable businesses that add to the bottom line, which is important when it comes to the world of business, but also think about, you know, when we build businesses, how does it actually benefit our communities, the people around us, or even environmental wise, you know, our planet. So People often ask me after 10 years in BC, um, why do you be an why are you an entrepreneur now? Right. And just as a quick background, I um, you know, I very since I graduated, my first job all the way to you know my last job has always been in technology investments, either on the private equity or the public equity side. And one of the key things that I saw that was lacking is I really saw a lot of you know, I saw so many products and services that's really catered towards the millennial consumer. I spent some time working in Razor, also on the IPO, and there was so much focus you know, on the millennial, even the IPO pitch deck was always like, you know, how do we pitch the millennials? They have great spending power and this and that, which is fair and good. But I also realized that, you know, in Singapore, we, you know, we live in an aging society. 
And I was just thinking about what are the things that we can do that can better empower us when we grow older and how do we challenge the notions of ageism be it in the workplace or in you know the societies that we live in and you know prior to the call George actually asked us what are your book you know what are some book recommendations that you had right so one of the books that I found really impactful was actually the book by Todd Harry it was called Die Empty and he started um the book asking you know, a group of students saying, where is the richest land in the world, right? And people would come up with comments saying like Silicon Valley, you know, like gold mine somewhere. And they're really looking at you know, rental per square foot kind of measurements. But the answer was actually you know, something when I, when I saw it, it was very, it resonated a lot with me because basically he said that it's the cemetery, right? Because it's where millions of people have died and they carried many valuable ideas and dreams of, that did not come to light in their lifetime. And for me, I thought that was very impactful. And that also drew me to remember about a movie that I watched in my time as an RGS girl. And that was Dead Poet Society, right? So in the book, he said that do not go to your grave carrying the best that you have, right? Always choose to die empty. Do the best work that you have, that you can do in your life. And so it reminded me about that scene in Dead Poets Society. So I'll just play a very short snippet. Let me know if you guys can hear the sound. Not that different from you, huh? It sounds good. Haircuts. Full of hormones, just like you. Invincible, just like you feel. The world is their oyster. They believe they're destined for great things, just like many of you. Their eyes are full of hope, just like you. Did they wait till it was too late to make from their lives even one iota of what they were capable? Because you see, gentlemen, these boys are now fertilizing daffodils. If you listen real close, you can hear them whisper their legacy to you. Go on, lean in. Listen. You hear it? So that was actually a scene that, you know, you know, sometimes when I feel uninspired or thinking what I want to do in life, you know, that's something that always draws me back to um, just remembering that our time on earth is limited and what do we want to do with it, right? And even when, we, when I speak to people who are, you know, Gen Z, people who are 25 now, there's always that anxiety of, you know, maybe wanting to succeed or, you know, what do you want to do? And, you know, my advice is actually start seeing your life as a blank canvas instead of a linear line because there's so much you can do in your time here. And to think about the question of how can we best contribute to the things that we care about in the limited time that we have here. So with that, you know, when I was a VC and investing in all these, looking at all these investment opportunities and looking at the ROI, looking at the team, looking at the product market feed traction, things like that. One of the gaps I saw was with regards to, you know, I, I really wanted to see more products and services catering to the elderly not just in a way that objectified them as somebody that's frail, right? Because if we look at anyone who's above 50, above 60, we are all going to get there, right? It's either we pass away young or we go to be 50 and 60. And it's not as if somebody changes past a certain age, right? Because you still have all that personality that you have developed over the years. In fact, they are much more interesting people because they have lived through such amazing life experiences and they have so much stories to tell right so like chat you know all your years at you know 
doing the things that you're doing is actually very valuable for you know any kind of startup entrepreneur. So with regards to what I'm doing in strong service, um, I believe that we are seeing the rise of silver influences globally. Even if we look at the statistics, we do see that people over 65 are the fastest growing consumer segment and 76% of them are in the consumer class in 10 years. And we are actually looking at the golden age of silver spending because there, there should be that shift in terms of spending from the millennials to the silvers. And there is a reason why, right? If you look at the people, the boomers today, it is the people who have actually worked in like the PMETs, they have actually saved you know, quite a fair amount of money. And these are also the people who are a lot more discerning with regards to their consumption choices. There is also a much higher you know, our demand for a high quality of life. And it's a little bit different from, let's say, the, you know, the Akong and Ama that we see today at Chinatown, right? I, think, I do believe that the silvers of tomorrow are going to be a lot more conscious of how they spend and also spending on, like, quality, spending on quality lifestyle. And we can see that brands are also taking note as well, right? We're seeing fashion houses like Celine and Saint Laurent and like Kate Spade actually featuring age positive models, which is, I like, you know, think that I think is a very interesting step in a good direction. And for us, it just in Singapore, like we have also started to reach out to what we call like silver influencers or age positive models. So Daddy Ming, if, if some of you guys are on TikTok, he is um, basically um, Ming's dad. So Ming is the guy that he's pouring water on here. And Daddy Ming, he wasn't somebody who, who actually wanted to be an influencer in any way at all. It's just that he was he was just helping his son out with his son, you know, in the height of COVID, it was like, hey, you know, dad, come and make some videos with me. And, and look at him now, he has 8.3 million TikTok fans, and he has actually that, that power to actually, you know, do a lot of content and actually a role model to let other people know that, hey, you know, social media is not something that you should be afraid of, you know, you should use, use that to tell your story. And on the right, we have Yen. So she's actually a really lovely lady. I really enjoy speaking to her. And she, and I believe in May, she was actually on a cover of Harper's Bazaar and Lucy Cell. And it's very rare that you see somebody in Singapore having four digit kind of following. So when she was actually on the cover, I think she was around 1.5 thousand followers. But because she's such an inspiring role model, like age positivity, she really cares about aging well. She's confident about, um, you know, she doesn't shy away from, you know, trying certain fashions or, or, or feeling that she just, she's not enough, right? And, and, and that has actually really attracted a lot of brands to work for her. Not just, you know, age-friendly products, but even, you know, really cool brands like Gentle Monster, right? Which is like the really popular sunglass brand actually has get, gotten her to be a brand ambassador. And for her, right, it's, it's multifold, right? Maybe she doesn't, she doesn't necessarily need the income, as like Chad rightly pointed out, a lot of retirees now, they don't necessarily need income. But when I spoke to her, she actually said that um, interacting with younger people and being and learning new technology actually helped her be much sharper in terms of cognition. And we know that mental decline and dementia are all you know, things that people start to take note of as they get into their 60s. And just, you know, just engaging with an intergenerational audience on social media is actually a good way to actually keep someone engaged as well. So basically, in a nutshell, we believe our seniors are valuable resources and we want to tell them, and we want to help them tell their stories, right? We're not, we want to have more people like Daddy Ming and Yen because, because really, I mean, they have so much to share with us. Even if you look at our moms, our grandmas, you know, they cook so well, for example, right? And, and you know, they could just share their recipes online. You know, it, it is as easy as just taking a video, telling them what you do. And, and, and that's the thing that I think, first, it engages them. It really um, takes advantage of what they know. And this is all very valuable. And it helps to, you know, record because like later on, um, later on in life, you, you know, people, you know, their grandchildren can see it. I mean, my own grandma passed away late last year, right? I only wish that I actually recorded more memories of her. So, yeah, and just, just to round up, one thing for RGSA webinar attendees, we have just tied up with one of Singapore's largest supplier of dried foods, 
So if you guys just scan the link or make sure we'll be sending the link, we'll be sending free samples to the people who sign up. And this is basically a push because this brand is actually looking to go into the B2C segment. And one of the things that we propose to them is like, hey, you know, you know, if we get, if we, we have like amas or moms actually use your ingredients and then start to post that kind of content online, it could also have to drive your B2C. So that's one of the things that we're working on right now. And it's also like, George says a little dog gift for the people who have signed up for today's webinar and for joining us at 3.30. So that's all I have for you today. And excited to hear the other speakers. Thank you so much, Junas. It's so lovely to hear your refreshing perspective. They are awesome and they're accurate on the untapped um, market, the silver market, and how you view them, you know, is really very touching and valuable. Um, I can see uh, Senior Minister Sim Anne on. And thank you so much for making time to join us despite your busy schedule. Anne, can you hear us? <laughs> Hi. Thank you. Anne is also our lifetime member, and I uh, would thank you for your support. Um, the next speaker I'm very excited to introduce is speaking from Mauritius, Min. Min is just slightly one year younger, also slightly one year older than Junas. She's the co-founder and CEO of Red Dot, making a huge splash in Mauritius. She's uh, from Richardson House, um, about Ming Xuan. She's the co-founder and CEO of Red Dot, and she is an impact entrepreneur, passionate about combining the power of business, design, and technology for a better world. She's currently the co-founder and CEO of Red Dot, an innovation consultancy based in Mauritius that builds businesses of tomorrow. She started her first company at 17 and has been a serial entrepreneur ever since. She has held positions in banking, healthcare, and education, was also part of the team at Quick, a Silicon Valley startup that sold to Skype for $150 million. She then co-founded Play Mula, a social enterprise that developed a unique model of game-based financial education using technology for behavior change and reached over 100,000 children and youth through partnerships with the government, major banks, schools, and community organizations. Min has a degree in finance and technology, technology entrepreneurship from the National University of Singapore and Stanford University. She now lives in Mauritius with her husband and a beautiful two-year-old daughter. Over to you, Min. Thanks so much, Jock. Let me share my screen. Can you see this right here? Okay, perfect. So thank you so much for the opportunity to share. We have some exciting work um, that we're doing in Mauritius and uh, I'd love to you know, frame this uh, sharing around um, building a little dot in Mauritius. So um, I was reflecting back on where it all started. And since this, this is an LGS alumni sharing, I realized even in my journey, the seeds were planted in LGS. This was um, the 14 year old me um, in my first business plan competition really long ago. Um, this was even before Singapore had this whole like startup, um, you know, uh, drive. And, you know, you, you kept seeing the same entrepreneurs at that time. It was Ilim Chiu, it was, you know, um, it's the same entrepreneurs. And we won our first um, entrepreneurship competition with a babysitting business, right? I, I look back and it was so, you know, innocent and naive at that time. Um, I remember that there was a big campaign in Singapore called Romance Singapore and Singapore government was trying to encourage more babies. So we say, hey, you know, let's, let's babysit, you know, the kids, you know, let the, let the parents go out, you know, get, you know, discounts at restaurants and hotels. And, you know, we, yeah, that was, that was the first business that uh, we thought of. And it was, I mean, we, we never, we never really built this, but it was a really, really nice experience getting out of academics and you know, testing and just being able to create something. You know, I think that was where I first really got addicted to the idea of creation and, and authoring the world that, you know, you could be part of. Um, so fast forward, I think, uh, John, you, you're very kind to um, 
to share the bio, I, I think that experience really unlocked my curiosity for life. And I, and I realized that, you know, there was a big gap between what I was learning in school and what I thought I needed to learn in life. And so I began working um, at 17 from waitressing to being in healthcare to, you know, doing branding. And that really helped me understand, you know, what are the problems and, and you know, where do I actually want to, want to work, you know? Um, and what that did was it also led me to a really nice experience. Um, some of you might know the NUS Overseas College, where you spend one year in a high growth uh, innovation hub. So I went to Silicon Valley, I got a stint at Stanford, I was part of this high growth startup at Quick, and that was really, really where I learned um, what being in a high growth startup actually meant. And later on, I then founded uh, Playmula, which is a social impact venture. Some of you might, might have heard of that. Um, we did a lot of work, you know, in behavior change and money. And, you know, I realized, I think like, like Grace, you know, with Zoom, I was, I was really deep in that, not taking salaries for many years, but really pushing the impact of, of the company to a point that I realized that the impact was made. I was really happy with the impact that we made, you know, working with kids and youth, schools, you know, um, single women, you know, to a point that, you know, the government actually also started looking at behavior change models and financial literacy curriculum in schools, right? And I'm like, okay, great, our impact is, is achieved. Um, but I want to share, since this is a financial empowerment seminar, one of the most defining moments I had in the Bay Area. And this was, um, this is Paul Graham, one of the godfathers of venture capital. He is behind Y Combinator, some of you might know. Um, and so the, he has this program called Startup School, where, you know, students who base, uh, entrepreneurs who basically pitch him ideas, and in a live audience, you know, he would do Q&A. And these were two girls from Stanford, and they were pitching an idea very, very early on, you know, to get more restaurants on Facebook, to, to increase, you know, their, their audience and, and their business. And I remember this one line, right, that Paul Graham said, and he said, you know, you girls, being from Stanford, he said, and, and you're trying to get businesses on Facebook. He said, it's better to do something hard if you're capable to do hard things. Why are you doing such an easy thing, right? Just bringing businesses on Facebook. And this was a recurring theme I saw in how investment was made in Silicon Valley, right? I would be in a classroom, right, with VCs and we'll be pitching ideas. And I, rem I remember one of the, uh, the VCs in the audience, you know, he said, you know, you guys have the perfect business plan. Like everything is fine on paper, but you're just not the right guys to do it, right? And then, you know, I'll, I'll be in other conversations where investors would say, okay, can you actually look me in the eye to say that your destiny in life, right? Is to get more, 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 for more, more restaurants, you know, on board, like more customers for restaurants. And there was such, I mean, and, and that was what I really loved about the Bay Area and investing. It was about solving the most difficult problems. It was connecting with, you know, what was the essence of why, why you were here. Um, and what I found, and a lot of my friends in the Bay Area found that in 2012, something actually changed. I, I felt that the spirit of Silicon Valley had changed away from doing hard things to valuations and you know, unicorns and funnels and advertising. And honestly, I was really, really tired, right? And so there was a point where my husband and I, um, who I met in Stanford, uh, we said, you know, let's leave and let's actually do something different. Let's, you know, using Juno's example, let's see life as a blank canvas and you know, where, where, what, what's the next chapter you know, in our life? Um, so then our plan was initially to move to Singapore to be closer to family. But we spent two weeks in Mauritius and decided to pack up our bags and move to Mauritius instead. Uh, my husband happens to be uh, from Mauritius, though he's never lived there. But we spent two, two weeks then, you know, Mauritius is actually part of the African uh, continent. So it's not to be confused with Maldives, which we mostly get confused with. And it's not sinking as well, um, but it's next to Madagascar, right? So very, uh, very much more isolated than Singapore, part of the Africa continent. When you think of Mauritius, most of the time you think of beaches, right? It's an amazingly beautiful place. If you love nature, you know, you love fresh air, you love beaches, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. And um, just to introduce you to the place, the land size is three times bigger than Singapore. It's a volcanic uh, island. So a lot of nice you know, hikes and, and, and climbing. Um, and it's a population of only 1.3 million people, right? So it's a perfect lab because anything small you do 
you can actually see national impact, right? There's a big diversity of cultures, Franco Mauritius, Chinese Mauritius, Hindu Mauritius, African Mauritius. Um, it's the highest per capita income in Africa. Um, it's very easy to set up business and there are huge opportunities if you're interested in sustainable development, right? So I'm personally very invested in, in education. Um, a lot of the families invested in healthcare and we really, really wanted to make an impact on the national level. So we came here and um, I was really, really glad that I did a 10 day silent meditation before I came. Because if I hadn't, I would come and say, okay, I want to you know, implement solution one, two, three, four, five, right? Um, but because I like took some time and you know, stepped back and like, okay, after 10 days, I decided to just, just spend one year observing, right? And just understanding um, the system that I was operating in, the new system that I was operating in. So it was a really fun one year. I did a whole bunch of experiments. Um, I taught social innovation at the African Leadership University. This is um, the class. And it basically is one of the most innovative universities on the continent. It wants to be the, the Harvard for Africa, but with an African context for education. And it promotes entrepreneurship, right? Not, not academia. Um, and I learned so much just about the continent from the students. Um, the second uh, thing, big experience I had was working with the government to work with nonprofits to see how they could solve social issues in Mauritius. And that really, really got me to understand, you know, what is the other side of the beaches, right? You can see the inequity, you can see gender violence, you can see drugs and youth. I mean, Mauritius has its own set of problems as well. Um, and what I realized in this system, it was very, very different from, you know, Singapore or the US that I, that I knew very well. The first thing is that this economy is small and is driven only by five large conglomerates who are basically landowners, right, gifted from, from, from the French. So you have these large conglomerates with about 100 companies under them, and they own everything, right, logistics, healthcare, I mean, they're all owned by, by these five companies. Um, and the government priority is really on preserving social order. And with a small budget, they're doing actually really well. I mean, I got vaccinated way early, you know. Um, they, I mean, they, they are doing what they can under a small budget, but they, unlike Singapore, don't have the resources to take big strategic bets, right? Um, what I also observe is that the public, private, and people sectors were very, very siloed. And there's, you know, not, and there's so much more that could be done with, um, you know, 3P partnerships. And the business culture for me was the one that was most shocking because I come from two places which is very results oriented. You put a solution in front of them with results and you know people buy the solution. Um, but over here it's very relationship based. Sometimes there's no performance management in the company. And because of the, the, the scarcity right, of resources, there's a very fixed pie mindset and everyone's really looking to see how, how I can get, right? how, how can I get um, the most out of it. And so, you know, with this context, we were thinking, okay, you know, how, what, what can we actually do, right, um, to solve the issues we were really concerned about, without, which ultimately were social issues. And the more I understood the system, I realized the biggest problem was this, right, that this is a beautiful, beautiful um, landscape that you see a lot in Mauritius. And it's because the leading export for Mauritius in 1970s was sugar, right? And the price of sugar has come down so much um, that the next innovation that Mauritius had was the export processing zone. Companies from abroad could come in, get double taxation treaties, and there was a lot of export of textiles before China woke up, right? And then we moved to tourism and financial sector and, and the financial services. And then today, the leading, I would say, growth industries are really, you know, finance, IT, which is only 5%, and the free port. Right. But if you look at these industries and they are still in Mauritius, a lot of them are under threat, right? Sugar, we are still trying to hold on, you know, go more upstream. Textiles, you know, we are again, you know, trying to go into vertical, you know, supply chain integration. Uh, tourism right now is really, really suffering. And financial services in Mauritius is a lot of um, back uh, business processing operations, right? So it's very easily commoditized. And when you look at the growth pillars of Mauritius, we are thinking, what is going to be the growth pillar in 2020, right? And to give you a sense of scale, um, I like to use this an analogy, and I think this goes back to what Chet was saying, that the economy of Mauritius is 14 billion, right? The size of Uber, a single startup, is 75 billion, right? And in contrast to Singapore, it's 340 billion, okay? And what we realized was that 
my uh, what 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 we decide to how we frame our problem is that the, the economy of Mauritius was just too small. And what are going to be the growth pillars of, of, of Mauritius right, in the next 10 years? So this was the hard problem we decided to tackle. And the game plan was, could, how could we actually develop a new layer of knowledge and technology assets, solving some of the toughest challenges across industries, which are specific to Mauritius as a lab, but to then scale to Indian Ocean Islands and the rest of the Africa continent. Right? And could this then be a context to systematically build a knowledge economy for Mauritius, right? to train Mauritius in globally competitive skills? And we wanted to do this because, again, if you understand the economy and how it's um, owned, right? um, Mauritius is highly, you know, highly um, vulnerable to exogenous shock. And we are saying, okay, the knowledge economy, that could be, that, you know, that could be mitigated. Right? What could we do that was infinitely scalable and cannot be commoditized compared to you know, BPO processing? How could we generate most of our value outside the borders of Mauritius, right? And not be constrained by talent, by labor, by land, by unsustainable factors of production, right? And how could we not be dependent on government's negotiating power abroad for import substitution and subsidies? And how could we really boost the national productivity and total tax base, right? So what we decided to do was, um, and I, the, the reason why we called it Red Dot was this is basically, you know, what Chet was saying, this is what the Singapore government has done. Um, and this is, I think, hardwired, you know, in, in kind of our blood to like, okay, what can a small group of people do that's world-class, right? Um, so we started Red Dot. I didn't have much inspiration for the name. We had to incorporate very quickly because we had contracts to sign. Um, and this is um, our core team. We're a very, very small team, but very multidisciplinary. We have a PhD in biochemistry. Uh, we have someone with uh, international relations. We have someone who's a doctor who then moved to programming. And we have Natasha, my co-founder, and Alan, um, and Carol. And we are a small team, but we have big engineering teams in India and South Africa. And the larger team we look at is actually the organizations that we work with. Right, so we, we work with large organizations, we speak to their leadership, and we look at board level challenges that we can then reframe into developing completely new ventures that are high scale right, and high growth. Okay, um, I'll just give you some examples of the recent work that we have done that we are really proud of. So post COVID, as you know, um, a lot of SMEs are struggling, and we tied up with um, the largest uh, commercial bank in, in Mauritius, the MCB Bank. And we decided to create a multi-sided platform where all stakeholders are aligned to the growth of SMEs, right? So you go into this platform, you can say, I'm an entrepreneur. You go in, you take a health check, right? Um, different health checks to look at your resilience, your cash flow, and then you are actually, uh, you're actually match with growth partners. So service-based companies that can help SMEs grow. And then we pair them with investors, right? So we are, we're, we're kind of moving them from, you know, um, status quo, right, to what, what are growth projects they can start working on. Okay, uh, second um, project that's really dear to my heart is um, actually very in line with what Junus is working on, the civil economy, to really reimagine aging and, and home-based care. Um, so this is a very, uh, very exciting elder care innovation platform, where we first start with, you know, positioning this as a one-stop platform for active aging and home care solutions. Um, on the back end, though, we are pioneering a new model of community care, right, to empower nurses to go into communities to monitor their health, personal assistance to provide companionship, you know, um, and, and when the PAs or the nurses go in, do a comprehensive assessment based on eight dimensions of successful aging. So not only the medical piece, but even like purpose, contribution to society, right? Um, quality of sleep, right? There are a lot of these research-based dimensions of aging that um, we are starting to, to get objective measures and interventions on. And finally, using technology to empower entire care teams to monitor um, outcomes right, and coordinate across the care team. So um, this is what we do for work. And the team, when we are up to mischief, we do a lot of other things like running uh, unconference meetups for change makers. We started fuck up nights um, to get you know, prominent business leaders to share their business failures. When COVID happened, you know, information and news was all over the place. So we started COVID Watch, um, and then a delivery system for food, and then you know, uh, like a like a help desk when the lockdown was there. Um, 
there's one of one of our one of our staff was very very interested in helping teachers you know um, be able to teach online right that was very very new for teachers here um, another part of the the team was working on locals.mu to get people to procure artisanal goods and uh, my co-founder is now really active in the board of good which is how do you get more women right in, in leadership positions and in, in board director positions so these are some um, fun projects that we do for fun, but if you just look at, I would say the common threads, right? And you know, in innovation, we don't believe in making long-term plans. I mean, you can't make long-term plans in the VUCA world. And the 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 operating principle we have is what are the key guiding principles to then you know govern what we do next. And so these are the six um, guiding principles from Red Dot. We take projects that are first um, have a big social impact. Two, they are highly scalable. Three, they must build local capacity in transferring of knowledge. Four, they must break down silos, you know, within the, the, the industry we are in to start connecting the dots and letting data and then connections and partnerships flow in new ways. Five, they must grow the pie. And six, how do we change the game and change, change paradigms, right, um, to how things are done. Um, so finally, I'll, I'll just end by, you know, by kind of concluding that one thing I've seen personally in my life as a, entrepreneurs that when I when I when I go into a place of scarcity like you know just thinking about you know um, how do I succeed you know things don't seem to work out you know and, and what I've seen in a lot of our ventures and those that have succeeded is really this quote that we rise by lifting others and it's a you know using using the um, I would say the principle that we use in our business also in my own life I've started living I think a lot more simply you know to say okay if there are just two basic principles of how you guide your decisions what are they right and for me it's that life is too short to be working with people we don't enjoy working with right and two that we must be serving something bigger than ourselves and with that, I'll end. Um, and happy to talk to anyone who wants to reach out to explore Mauritius and explore going to Africa. Um, we are happy to take your startup um, into these markets. Thank you. Thank you so much, Min, for such exciting sharing. I could hear the passion in your voice as you were sharing uh, about how you are building capabilities and bringing capital into Mauritius from a very studied approach and how you're encompassing the entire Mauritius in your game plan. That's really quite awesome. And also um, looking at the beautiful picture of Mauritius, we might, when things are more settled, plan a trip to Mauritius and uh, integrate Africa and have you as our um, tour guide. And of course, bringing in startups as well from maybe a little red dot here to that little red dot in Mauritius. The next speaker I, I'm very proud to uh, share, um, to introduce is a uh, Dr. Natalie Ko. It's uh, very, very early now in uh, San Francisco, in Stanford, where Natalie is based. Uh, Natalie uh, is a cardiologist and medical advisor of White Coat. She's from the class of 2001, Hadley House. She's passionate about co creating scalable, sustainable digital health solutions, particularly in the field of predictive and preventive care. Her clinical interests are in cardiometabolic disease and non-invasive cardiac imaging. Natalie is now doing a master's of science in clinical informatics, informatics management at Stanford University School of Medicine. And Natalie is speaking to us from Stanford. Welcome Natalie and thank you for sharing with us. Over to you, believing that you can. Thank you everyone for your amazing presentations. What an afternoon. Um, it's so hard to come last and especially to come after Min. I will do my best. The topic of my talk today is believing that you can, which really is the first step to doing whatever it is that you're meant to do. You know, when Jiog approached me to speak about my journey as an entrepreneur, for this series of financial empowerment, these are words that I don't necessarily apply to myself. Uh, my first thought was, that can't be me. But, um, you know, this exercise really got me thinking as to what I am, where I am, and who I am. 
and what I am. Um, I am a cardiologist. I graduated in 2009. I've been working for over a decade. Um, these are my parents. They attended many graduations with me, um, and I'm very proud of them. Aside from being a cardiologist, I am also a digital health entrepreneur and I'm currently serving as medical advisor to White Coat. White Coat is Singapore's first regulatory approved telemedicine provider and a leading provider of on-demand video consults all the way to final mile medication delivery. Um, I started this with my brother. He is currently running the business. I wish he were by my side today um, as we have been for all our lives. We started with general practice, but have since gone on since our inception in 2018 to incorporate multiple verticals, such as mental wellness, pediatrics now on demand, and also home-based health screening. The pandemic has dramatically changed the healthcare, the healthcare landscape indelibly. And White Coat is at the forefront of change adoption to evolve and grow with these shifting times for the people we serve. I am presently in California and just arrived three weeks ago. It's currently 2 a.m. and I'm fresh off the boat. Um, I will explain what on earth I'm doing here in the midst of a pandemic. But first, um, I wanted to talk to us about a song. Pink is my favorite, one of my favorite artists. She wrote this song about a month and a half ago for her daughter. It's called All I Know So Far. I haven't always been this way. I wasn't born a renegade. I felt alone, I still feel afraid, but I stumble through it anyway. I wish someone told me that this life is ours to choose. No one's handing you the keys or a book with all the rules. The little that I know, I'll tell to you. When they dress you up in lies and you're left naked with the truth, what then? So pink really kept me through my loneliness. Um, I first heard this while, I was drive while we were driving down the California freeway. And I'll go through the rest of the lyrics as we, as we go along. She had me at, I haven't always been this way. I wasn't born a renegade. This chat that we're having today, I like to think of it as chapters in a book that I'm currently writing of life from my perspective that I'd really like to share with you. It is of course still a work in progress. It isn't, enti it isn't supposed to be didactic or a recipe of any sort. Let's just think of it as sharing my story Yes, it involves entrepreneurship, management, and many other things you find in books everywhere. But this is my story, and I hope that it brings to life what it takes to get me through it. So in this first chapter, it's about understanding who you are and what you stand for. You know, I talked about what I am, where I am, who am I? I really wasn't born a renegade. <laughs> I am first and foremost family. Now, these photos are really fresh. They are less than three days old. That's my 93-year-old Pawpaw finally learning how to use FaceTime because I've flown the coop and she misses me so much. Now, that's elderly for you. And this is from a family photo shoot taken a few days before I flew. My family is everything to me. They are my superpower, my reservoir of strength, and they represent everything that I stand for. Love for others, loyalty, fairness, and consistency. Growing up, I read many biographies of people I found interesting, and I was in my teens when I read this obituary that JFK Jr. gave his mother, Jackie O, at her funeral, describing three attributes of hers, which I felt resonated so strongly with me. The love of words, the bonds of home and family, and her spirit of adventure. Knowing who you are and what you stand for allows you to find your mission and purpose. Ping sings, I wish someone told me that this life is ours to choose. It is our life and we get to choose. You know, it's funny how so many people live their lives asking for permission to do what they want. I think if we know who we are, we will not need permission to do what we have to because there probably isn't any other way to live. And that is what all the other four speakers have shown you today. So, love for others, loyalty, fairness, and consistency. This picture that I took in 2014 at Changbaru Market near where I work summarizes what drove White, what drove White Coat's creation. At the forefront, in the front line as a cardiology resident, 
I saw vulnerable patients not always having ready access to care when they needed it the most, often queuing for hours to see the doctor when a lot of things could be translated to FaceTime with video consult and final mal medication delivery. I mean, look at my 93-year-old grandma. So in trying to look and explore solutions, I went down the rabbit hole of the internet of things, all these wearables, invisibles that we could put in the home for vulnerable or ill patients. And it led me to realize that everything that we're talking about actually hinges on building a digital ecosystem, which was not yet available in Singapore, to leverage on the network effects of such wearables in order to bridge the gaps in our current healthcare system delivery. If you know who you are and you have a purpose, it becomes very clear um, why you want to do what you want to do. And, you know, this has become our North Star. We started with the vision of, you know, being that healthcare provider, the doctor in your pocket for Singaporeans. We are proudly Singaporean, but we also want to bring this Singaporean solution to the world. And we have already begun making inroads into the region. And what we really want is a doctor in every community. Having this purpose, this vision, this mission becomes your North Star as you journey through life. Don't be afraid to question the status quo. Ping sings. No one's handing you the keys or a book with all the rules. Well, it's true. No one's going to give you the answers, but they're going to give you a whole book of things that you have to go through. The fact that you see video consults, telemedicine, Zoom vet everywhere surround, surrounding you today is actually really, really different if you were to just cut and paste yourself and put yourself in 2015, which is when we first started. You know, these are the guidelines we had to go through. And these are what everyone said. You know, the status quo is that healthcare is one of the most heavily regulated industries. Video consult, what about your HIPAA compliance, PDPA, data security, where's the NTG? What about malpractice insurance? And most importantly, why hasn't anyone else done it before? So, you know, the fine print is scary and it was still uncharted territory back in 2015, but driven by the conviction and purpose that we had and the solution that we believed we could provide, we knew the questions we would like to have answered and to whom they needed to be addressed people in power, people who can effect the change, the regulators. And you know what? We approached them with purpose, with open conversation. The conversation was constructive, progressive. And by 2018 in April, after two and a half years of engagement, in a national first, the Ministry of Health announced the creation of a regulatory sandbox and the first adoptee into this sandbox was White Coat. And the idea behind this sandbox was after so many months and years of conversations was to give patients early access to new healthcare models in a safe and controlled environment. And we now see how well this has served us in terms of resilience and flexibility through this COVID-19 pandemic. Because we had the 2018 runway, when COVID-19 hit our shores on March 2020, we were set up with supply chain logistics for final mile delivery of medication and payer uh, payer insurance on board to continue that care through the pandemic as patients needed it. So this regulatory approval, this growth, yes, it's everything we hoped for. We do have a seat at the table, but we want to continue the conversation and we want to continue being part of good practice of telemedicine and digital health in Singapore. So I really don't take very many pictures. And this is one that I had to pull out from my iPhone of our opening day. You know, we opened in June 2018. It was such a proud moment. I don't have children, but I think this is probably an approximation of childbirth. So the next chapter, finding your team. I felt alone, still feel afraid, but I stumbled through it anyway, because you have, you're surrounded by people. And I think this is a common thread that has been woven through everyone's narrative today. Who do you hire? Who do you fire? Who do you work with? Who's your tribe? One of, you know, one of the best things about this whole process are the many, many wonderful people I've met along the way. Teamwork makes the dream work. And you really, re but really friends weather storms with you. They sit by your side when you're being obstinate and wait patiently until you find that humility to think again and a come back to the table and bang those issues through. And also your family never gives up on you. Um, 
I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the many, many others who have journeyed with me beyond what you can see on screen, loved and cared for me. I cannot pay you back, but I will spend my life paying it forward. So in this next chapter, um, I think we really need to understand the value of thinking again and staying curious because when you let the walls crack, it lets the light in. And these are all song lyrics, I didn't write them. So Adam Grant is one of my favorite writers and thinkers, and he challenges our ossification of thought in his new book, Think Again, that was just published in February this year. So, you know, it's really annoying. Instead of rethinking, you know, and looking at problems from a different angle, instead of unlearning what we unlearning all the burden of truths that are actually not truths, people tell you and you tell yourself all these things that will never work. That's not what my experience has shown. That's too complicated. Let's not overthink it. That's the way we've always done it. We become a prison of experience. And Adam Grant's book teaches you, you know, that rethinking is a skill set, yes, um, but it's also a mindset and it's a mental tool that as we embrace the volatility, the volatility of a pandemic-driven world here to stay, you know, we need to be nimble, we need to challenge our truths, we need to be open-minded and scientific in our hypothesis as to what is going to work and what isn't. Um, we need to confront our fear of being wrong. And he also mentions the second thing that I learned so much about, which is the concept of confident humility. It is so important, he put it as the second chapter in his book, and it is meant to be the vaccine to imposter syndrome. So what is confident humility? It's basically knowing that you don't have the answer, the humility to know that, but also believing that you'll be able to find that answer. And it is confident humility that is going to bring me through to the next two chapters that I'm going to talk about. Getting, uncomfortable, getting comfortable with uncertainties. Pink sings this to her daughter. I wish someone would have told me that this darkness comes and goes. People will pretend, but baby girl, nobody knows. And I'll let you in on a secret, okay? Nobody knows. No matter how much they pretend they do, they simply don't. Why? It's a function of time. It's science. We simply cannot predict what will happen next. We, I mean, we really don't, we can predict, but we don't know what will happen next. And that is exactly what being an entrepreneur is. It means this, okay? It means embracing chaos and framing it as an opportunity to learn, believing relentlessly in yourself that you'll get up on your feet fighting. You'll get up to live another day to find the answer to your question. The life cycle of a startup is utter chaos without your North Star, your purpose, being the Singapore doctor in every community, being a doctor in every community, you'd get lost in a morass of competing interests and ups and downs that mark the volatility associated with work at the frontier of change. You know, I really cannot say I relish volatility. Who on earth will? You know, I mean, I'm not a risk taker. I, I really would not put myself in that category, but in the course of preparing for this, I realized that the proof is such. Innately, in the, my choice of profession and life choices, um, I have grown pretty comfortable with volatility. I don't actively look for it, but I've learned to ride that wave. And um, this brings me to the next chapter. Um, in June this year, three weeks ago, I took a flight out um, and uh, my parents had to drop me curbside. They couldn't see me off. Um, Changi was a ghost town. It was so sad to see the state of the airport. Um, put on my N95 mask for 20, 20 hours to make this trip out. Um, and that's because I truly believe in this. You need to keep up to date and keep learning. Even if I can't teach you how to fly, I can show you how to live like your life is on the line. You need to find it, you know, when you're driven by questions, you will go all out to find those answers with confident humility. If cash is fuel for business, for someone in an advisory role like myself, our intellect is our oxygen. I think that when one's purpose is very, very, very clear, and we spend so much of our time ruminating about that problem, going through it in our heads, it becomes apparent when we cannot work out the solutions anymore, 
and therefore we are motivated to seek out expertise to get ourselves better. Yes, for me, it meant pursuing an executive MBA to better understand how business works in order to, you know, to table sustainable solutions. And I put this up here because it really crystallizes what I feel about education. It's not the medium of education, it is the endeavor to learn. And lifelong learning is essential as breathing in order to stay relevant as the world evolves quickly. You know, the pandemic has opened up so many streams of learning never before possible. Virtual master degree programs, you know, podcasts, webinars like we have right now, Zoom meetings is just a panoply of choice, a cornucopia of education that we can be a part of to find those solutions, to find the answers to the questions that we, that we seek. The MBA, to me, it was not the master's, it's not the paper qualifications, it was my friends, new networks, new friendships. Before I flew, this is what they built for me. They came up with a wallpaper to wish me farewell. You know, from everywhere, north, south, east, and west, around the world, people logged in. You know, it's, um, it, it's about that collectivism, multiplying our collective thoughts, pinging against each other, giving rise to an exponential interchange that can only drive humanity forward. This drive to seek answers also means making my way halfway around the world to continue to pursue new interactions and intellectual vistas at Stanford because you know digital medicine is such a frontier land. The program I'm currently pursuing is the first of its kind and we are the inaugural batch, which I must say um, is pretty wild. I think at 36, um, I feel a lot closer to a 26-year-old student than a cardiology consultant pushing 40. And I can tell you, I am living the dormitory life to prove it, okay? <laughs> so in summary, I think believing that you can, that you can find your purpose, your team, your solutions is the mustard seed that must take root in order for you to embrace life like an entrepreneur, fearlessly, rationally, and sustainably. You know, and I believe there are so many chapters of life left to be written. But in conclusion, I think I would be pretty happy if this is all there was left to write about my life. The love of people, the bonds of home and family, and her spirit of adventure. And I really wouldn't have had it any other way, um, not even at 2.10 a.m. in the morning. Thank you so much for having me today. And I think I'm the last one. That's it. Thank you so much, Natalie. Last, but definitely not the least. And I think we've chosen you uh, correctly to do a beautiful roundup for today's sharing. One of the questions that is asked of Grace from Zumba. What has been your experience of unlimited leave policy and its take up rate among staff? Has it resulted in a happier, fulfilled and productive staff force at Zumbat? Mm. I, I think great question. I think even before we, we delved into unlimited leave, we also did quite a lot of um, reading around it. Uh, we looked at case studies from other companies and I think there definitely are places where it's great. Uh, and places where it's totally not suitable because of the nature of work uh, that you, you, you know, your company uh, is involved in. So I think ensuring that that sort of a work um, style is, is suitable for your company and its operations is probably the first thing that you should sort of look at. Um, I think the second thing um, is also um, if, no, with, with this policy, the main reason why we looked at it was because it aligned um, with our core values. And I think it was uh, an easy way for us to demonstrate as leadership that we wanted to extend this trust to our staff and to trust them first. Um, and I think uh, whether or not a policy like that you know, works or fails spectacularly is entirely dependent on whether or not you know, your employees um, are motivated and whether or not or no, they're just out to you know, game the system. I think um, it works really well um, if you're able to, through demonstrating um, this distrust, foster um, an environment of mutual trust and responsibility, um, and and you know, 
and and I think that that's when the employees feel that the the, the management genuinely cares for their well being, um, and this does motivate them to work harder. Yeah, so I think um, it's it's given our staff um, a certain amount of um, relief in that if they have personal matters that they need to attend to, um, that they have the flexibility to do so. Um, caveated, of course, um, with that they shouldn't be abusing this trust and that things like proper handover, communication with your you know, other teammates is super important so that when people go on leave, it's no longer, ah, I need to cover them, I need to pick up their workload, I need to pick up the slack. It's more like, how can I support you so that you can rest? And, and I know that this is going to be, you know, a, a mutual exchange. Yeah. I think I digress, but yeah. <laughs> I think the answer is somewhere in there. <laughs> it's very on point to the extent that, you know, you're creating trust, and which is very important in your working environment. And then there's a lot of unity within your team as well. So thank you for taking the question and answering it so well. Thanks, Grace. So um, looks like um, we are, you know, uh, running a bit out of time here. Uh, there are a number of questions up on the um, chat, some sent to me personally. Um, one of the questions is um, I would direct to uh, chat, which is uh, what is the runway required to start a business? So I'm, I'm referring to companies that is what in what I call in the seed stage, right? You just got an mm -hmm. idea and you have to commercialize it into what they call a minimum viable product, MVP. And so if that's the journey, then I think typically uh, we look for companies uh, earlier on, uh, we, I think ZoomVet talks about four or so people. We look for companies that's burning at about 20, 30,000 a month. Okay, of course you pay yourself very low. And um, we typically look for companies that have at least a 12 to 18 months runway with the money we give them for a very simple reason. It takes time to get the idea into an MVP stage. And, um, and after you get there, then investors will come in and fund you for commercialization and things like that. And also very often, and, and I'm very, okay, I'm just, it's not because CMN is here, but I'm very appreciative of what the government is doing. Um, they really pour in a lot. I saw it for myself. They really pour in a lot of money to help startups. So they have a lot of uh, grants like proof of concept, proof of value and things like that, that you could tap into that helps with the, the runway. And uh, so, so, so I think, you know, it's somewhere in the ballpark of 12 to 18 months runway, 20, 30,000 uh, months expenses. I think that would be roughly what we'll be looking at. Mm. Yeah, thank you so much, Chet, for the answer. And indeed, um, our government has really been very supportive of uh, startup entrepreneurs and with lots of fundings and education as well. So thank you so much uh, on behalf of uh, us. Uh, you can bring this message to, uh, you know, your, your colleagues uh, in the ministry, uh, uh, and to let them know what a great job they're doing uh, for uh, this group of entrepreneurs and uh, people who are interested in the startups uh, ecosystem. Um, I would like to uh, perhaps have a quick roundup. And from today's uh, learning experience, you will see the three A's in, a, in all these ladies. For all these entrepreneurs, they look like they have the ability. What, what partitions, what differentiates them from other people is their ability to thrive in uncertainty. And they are the author of their own projects, their own destinies, their own initiatives. And they have the ability to sell their ideas. You look at the passion that they speak with about their projects and what they're doing, and they're so sold uh, to each and every one. You listen to Chad, you want to go into investing. You go you listen to Grace, you want to invest in Zoom Vets. You listen to Junas, you want to go into Strong Silvers. You listen to Min and you want to go into Mauritius and, you know, and bring your startups there and learn from her. And you listen to Ned, you're so purpose-driven and a doctor in every community. What an amazing vision. So, um, now I would like to make some announcements and some shout outs for other fellow alumni who are doing great work out there. Um, the purpose of this webinar is also to use our all girls network to reach out to the community and uh, as a force. So I assume that you're here, you're interested to hear more about financial empowerment, fintech, impact investing, and making a difference in the lives of others. I'm pleased to share that one of our RGS alumni is now running 
Makan Pohop Festival and fundraising $125,000 for Fei Yue Community Services. This series of 30 virtual intimate roundtable conversations are led by leading VC firms like Vertex Ventures, Monks Hill, Golden Gate Ventures, and startup co-founders of start startups like Helicap, Carousel, Shopback. You can sign up for a seat at the round table to discuss interesting projects, topics such as blockchain, fintech evolution, unbanked and underbanked markets in Southeast Asia. All the event proceeds go to underfunded programs such as speech and occupational therapy for children with special needs and from low income family. We will, um, uh, my uh, CTO Shimin has already put up the um, web link on our chat group. So if you like to, you can go there. And also we will send that to you, the Makan for Hope. And there's also a uh, promo code. Uh, you get 33% off um, you know, by signing up. So do support that. So far they have raised $70,000. Um, still about 55 to go. So um, bring your money there to help the uh, underprivileged and under uh, and those with special needs. The other person uh, I would like to highlight is uh, Tang Ti Kun. Tang Ti Kun is our violin virtuoso. She's doing a great job with her, uh, with her talent. She's a scholar with the National Arts Council. Um, she has performed everywhere. Ti Kun, there you are, dear. Right. Um, Ti Kun is waving, yeah. Um, she is um, doing great work with a charity, which has just received the charity status. The charity is called Simas. Um, she has just received a sponsorship of a six-figure uh, amount um, to create music programs um, for uh, people with, uh, for children with special needs and children from low-income family. Uh, awesome work there, Tikun. Very, very touched uh, by what you're doing. Okay. Um, Next, uh, well, I want also to um, thank everyone for coming. And Junas, our strong silvers entrepreneur there, has arranged with one of the Singapore's largest uh, supplier uh, to uh, give us a nice virtual goodie bag for everyone who is attending. So thank you, Junas. And uh, last but not the least, in fact, very important is for those RGS girls out there, please sign up to be a lifetime member of RGS and so that we can create a strong legacy of uh, advocates of excellence so that we can serve our community together. So thank you very much for a very fine afternoon and lovely afternoon uh, with you. Thank you for to my panelists. Uh, I want to call their names again because they're so amazing. Chet, Grace, Junas, Min and Natalie. Um, Natalie, I hope you can get a good rest after this. Well-deserved one. Um, and Min, all the way to Mauritius, our love to you and your family there. Uh, thank you, everyone, and I uh, look forward to seeing you in our next uh, webinar that's coming up on the 24th of uh, July. It's a medical webinar, and also we have on financial planning. Um, you, it's going to be very exciting, so watch this space. Thank you once again, uh, Minister Sim Ann, for being with us, and the rest of you as well. Thank you, and uh, have a great day. Thank you, everybody.